an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Hey, Jerusalem, our glory is just around the corner, Jesus. That was their thinking. Oh, what it's going to mean when Jesus takes the throne. He wipes those Romans out of our way. We're all going to be great. And they were even arguing over who was going to be the greatest. But Jesus had other things on his mind. And apparently on his face. A short time later, Jesus says in Luke 13, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem meant one thing for Jesus, death. And he knew it wasn't going to be a quick and heroic death. He clearly told them before he died in Luke 18, Behold, we're going to go up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, he will be mocked, these are Jesus' words, he'll be shamefully treated, he'll be spit upon, they will scourge him, and they will kill him. He was speaking plainly to his disciples. When Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, he steadfastly set his face to go there to die. Remember when you think of Jesus' resolution to die, that he had a nature like ours. Yes, he was fully God, but also, yes, he was fully man. He would have shrunk back from pain like we do. At one point he prayed to his father that if possible, let this cup of suffering pass from him. The stress of his upcoming death caused him to sweat blood. As a man, he would, like we enjoy, he would have probably enjoyed getting married, having kids and grandkids, a long life, esteem in the community. He had a mother, he had brothers, he had sisters, he had special places he liked to visit. He had close friends. To turn his back on all this and to steadfastly set his face towards what he already knew was awaiting him. It's incredible. Vicious whipping was awaiting him. Beating, spitting, insults, disrespect, mocking, and crucifixion at the hands of those that he created. That's not easy. It was hard to say the least to know of the specific suffering he was about to endure in Jerusalem at the hands of those that he created and at the hands of those that he loved dearly. That hurts. Can we put our place in his place and think about what that felt like? I don't think we can. I don't know any place for us to begin to know how much he loved us. In fact, he himself said, greater love has no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus demonstrated the greatest of love. If we were to look at Jesus' death merely as an earthly death or just the result of of a betrayer's deceit, or a Sanhedrin's envy, or Pilate's spinelessness, or the soldier's nails and spears, or maybe even just a big misunderstanding. His death might seem very involuntary, or maybe just kind of random. And the benefit of salvation that comes to us, those who believe, from this death might be viewed as God making something virtuous out of, of, of necessity. But once you read Luke 9, 51, such thoughts vanished. Again, now it came to pass, when the time had come for Jesus to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was not accidentally entangled in a web of injustice. The saving benefits of his death for sinners was not an afterthought. God planned it all out of infinite love to sinners like us at an appointed time. Jesus, who was the very embodiment of the Father's love for sinners, saw that the time has come, and he steadfastly set his face to fulfill his God-given mission, to die in Jerusalem for our sake. None of it was by accident or by a stroke of bad luck. Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. Jesus clearly taught that, not just here in Luke 9, but also John records, this is in John 10, 18, Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me. I can lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. It was voluntary. 
So Jesus freely and lovingly, steadfastly sets out for Jerusalem. And it says in the text that he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But the people would not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. They could plainly read what his face was saying. I don't know if the villages rejected this as just because Jesus and his companions are Jews and Samaritans are supposed to hate the Jews or whether the rejection is more just a personal rejection of Jesus as the Messiah on his way to reign in Jerusalem. What does matter is simply that Jesus is already being rejected even as he lives. But then the focus of the passage shifts to the disciples' response, specifically the response of James and John. James and John asked Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? They would have loved that, wouldn't they? <laughs> they would have saw that as a happy ending. Ah, story's over. You should have saw it that day, guys. Fire came down and poof, the village was gone. Now their thoughts were like this. <clears throat> Jesus, by the way, already named these brothers sons of thunder. And here we get a glimpse why they were called that. Their thoughts were like this. Jesus, we're on our way to victory. Nothing can stop us now. Let fire fall. Let the judgment begin. Oh, Jerusalem's going to be trembling when they see you coming. Yeehaw, Jesus. <laughs> it's interesting. Jesus just turns. The text says, remember, his face was steadfastly set. And it says he, he rebuked them. Amazing, isn't it? And they simply went on to another town. A poignant and apt response. Now what does this mean? It means first of all that a mistaken view of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem can lead to a mistaken view of discipleship. If Jesus had come to execute judgment and take up an earthly rule, then it would make sense to the sons of thunder to begin the judgment when the final siege of the holy city begins. But if Jesus had not come to judge but to save, then a radically different form of discipleship is in order. And here's a question put to all of us by this text. Does discipleship mean deploying man's weapons against the enemy in righteous indignation? Is that what discipleship is? Or does discipleship mean following Jesus on the Calvary Road which leads to suffering and death? The answer to the whole New Testament is this. Jesus the Messiah came to live a life of sacrificial dying service. Then rising again, he now goes back to heaven before he will come a second time to judge and to reign in glory. So true discipleship is a life of following Jesus. And following Jesus always demands a life from us as him as our example of sacrificial dying service before we can reign with Christ in glory. When James, what James and John had to learn, and what we all must need to learn, is that Jesus' journey to Jerusalem really is our journey. He set his face to go there and die. We must follow his example. Set our face to die with him. We must die to our ways. We must die to our sin. We must die to what we want. We must die to our plans. We as disciples have the privilege to make him our Lord and get off of our throne and make him the master. Paul said the gospel was no longer I who live, but Christ now living in me. I've died. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who died for me. Followers of Jesus simply are called that because they follow Jesus. It's a pretty tough one, isn't it? <laughs> one might be tempted to reason the opposite way, though. You know, you, that since Jesus suffered so much and died in our place, therefore we're free to go live a life of ease and comfort. We might justify a self-centered life by reasoning, well, he suffered so we could have comfort. He died so we could live. He bore abuse so we could be esteemed. He gave up the treasures of heaven so we could lay up treasures on earth. He brought the kingdom, he paid for our entrance, and now we can live in it with all of its earthly privileges. That's what James and John were kind of thinking, wasn't it? But all that's not biblical reasoning. It even goes against the plain teaching in the very context of this story. Further up in chapter 9 of Luke, 
in 23 and 24, Jesus himself says, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. When Jesus resolutely and steadfastly set his face to walk the road to Jerusalem to die, he was not merely taking our place, he was also setting our pattern. He is our substitute and example in his death as well as in his life and resurrection. If we seek to secure our life through returning evil for evil, that's what James and John wanted to do, didn't they? We're going to get back at them Romans. But if we seek to do that, if we seek to take revenge, if we seek to surround ourselves with luxury, doing nothing to meet the needs of others, controlling our own destiny, we're going to wind up losing our life. Plain and simple. That's what Jesus said. According to Jesus, we can only save our life only if we follow Christ on the road to dying to ourselves. Jesus died to save us from the power and punishment of sin. Hey, Mark, I did turn that off. You might turn it over to heat on top. Yeah, just to the right. That's all I need, I think. Thank you. According to Jesus, we can only save our life only if we follow on the road to dying to ourselves. He really didn't die to save us from all suffering and tribulation, our personal sacrifices that need to be made for others. Remember, he gave us a heads up when he said to his disciples, in this world you're going to have tribulation. There will be suffering. There will be a cross for you to pick up, to bear, if you're going to be my disciple. Notice also in verses 57 and 58, which we didn't read, this is what Jesus said so that the sons of thunder could hear this day. A, a man came up to them. And as they were going along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. <coughs> Jesus said to him, well, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Why does Jesus tell a would-be disciple that he has no place to lay his head? The answer is simple because Jesus expects his disciples to be like him. He wants them to know that it is costly. The road is not necessarily the road of popularity, our prosperity, our ease and comfort. Yes, our Lord does provide for us. Nobody would deny that. But as Paul experienced, it's a life of trusting him in any and every circumstance. Whether in abundance or in need, whether well fed or hungry, Paul said we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If you're like me, Jesus Christ is the most precious thing we got. It's not our house. It's not our vehicles. It's not our jobs. Those things are important. But the real goal in this life is His truth. His taking away our guilt. His given us the hope of eternal life. His gift of genuineness. Everything can be up on the table in the kingdom of God. We can walk in light and truth. It don't have to be shaded under the table anymore. We got His presence in our family. We get to be part of the church, the kingdom of God on the earth. And we get to know His altogether completely satisfying spiritual beauty. I love Jesus Christ. And I want to follow His footsteps on His road. But really it's a road to die to myself and to live fully for Him. And on this road, myself and probably most of us here today, we really want to bring others with us, don't we? Yeah, that's the whole, that's the whole goal here in life. We want to get the message out. There's a world that is lost and confused and needs to come to Jesus. So that we want them to experience the most precious things in life too. If we're filled with the Spirit and His Word, we will praise the Lord from our hearts. And then we live all for love's sake, instead of retaliation, or luxury, or other worthless things. We ourselves, our faces, our countenances, our lives, our message, will be the most compelling invitation that Christ can give. With God daily helping us, we can be an example so that others might see light in a dark world. They can gain hope, or they have no hope. If Christ set His face to go to Jerusalem, we ought to be able to help one another week after week to set our faces 
against the distractions that are always before us and simply follow the King of Kings as we pick up our cross and follow Him. He said He would help us. Remember it says, let your way of life be free from the love of money, for He Himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We got the real gold. Amen. Don't be satisfied for the cheap stuff. So what we can take away from this passage of Scripture today, I think we can take away five things and we can apply them to our life. And that's the goal in it. Lord, give us your word and change us. Give us something that we can grow up unto and see your word and your spirit change us. I think the first takeaway for us is the Lord Jesus was getting ready and he was helping others to get ready. When do you get ready in your life? Did you guys get ready to come here today? And when do you help others get ready? Did you have any little ones to help get ready? Our big ones. My, my, my wife helped me get ready. <laughs> you get ready in your life when you know you're going somewhere. You prepare for it. And you prepare those around you who are going to go with you. Hey, it's almost time to go. Get ready. It's the greatest calling that we have here in this 21st century to prepare ourselves and to help prepare others for an encounter with Jesus. It's coming. It can happen on this earth. It's best if it does. <clears throat> Many know so little in our culture. They are confused. Maybe even they're hostile about what they know about supposedly Christianity. So Jesus prepares them often by sending us to befriend them. God's still using you guys. There's people out there that need to hear, to talk to them, explain things to them, and maybe to diffuse a situation that could explode in resentment or anger depending on their past experience. Jesus comes in saving power to people who are prepared to meet them. He often has made them ready through people like us who are servants who become experienced in doing this. How do you become experienced in preparing others to meet with Jesus? By doing it again and again. Sharing the truth of the Savior and His gospel, living for Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, spending time with Him, so your countenance can be seen by others. There's something different about that guy. Sharing the truth of the Savior and the gospel and the power of His Spirit and leaving the results to God. That's His job. Our job is just to faithful share. So that's the first one. The Lord was getting ready and was helping others to get ready. With God ourselves, we can be prepared and we can help others be prepared. The second thing that Jesus was resolute in setting out for Jerusalem to die. We can also live with such purpose and resolution. Nothing was going to stop Jesus. The hatred from those he loved wouldn't stop him from going to Jerusalem to die. The 39 lashes wouldn't stop him. The punches and the spitting in the face wouldn't stop him. The beard plucking wouldn't stop him. The mockery and the lying witnesses wouldn't stop him. The weight of the cross, the chanting of the mob wouldn't stop him. The crucifixions, the nails in his hands and his feet, the spear in his side. His body suspended for hours on the cross wouldn't stop him. The absence of the comfort of God, the waves of divine wrath breaking over him would not stop him going to Golgotha and laying down his life for us because he loved so much people like you and me. He had made up his mind. To redeem us comes at a great cost to himself. Yes, he was going to heaven, but the only route there lay through the lash and the nails and the spear in the grave. So he resolutely set his face to Jerusalem and he chose that. He humbled himself to that death. He did it quite deliberately. It's even recorded that he did it for the joy set before him. Imagine that. His flesh naturally repulsed. His friends sought to persuade him otherwise. But Jesus was determined to go. Why? Because only by his death, the death on the cross, could we enter heaven with him. And only in this way could our sin and guilt be removed. The Lord Jesus was resolute to give his life a ransom for many. And you and I can be steadfastly set to fulfill our God-given purpose on this earth as well. The third thing, the Lord Jesus was rejected. And we also at times will face rejection. We learn that Jesus' men had gone to the Samaritan village as he told them to go. The Samaritans del deliberated for a while. And they reported back, we don't want you here. Go, don't come here. You're not welcome. You are Jews. 
we don't have no dealings with your Jesus or with Jews. Get out of our town. They rejected it. It's not supposed to happen like that, is it? I mean, we hear again that religious enthusiasts say that people all over are looking for Jesus. There's a hunger for him, and they'll gladly receive him. But often you might find that's not the case. All over Samaria at this time, and really today all over Europe, Africa, the Middle East, even in the United States, even in St. Jen County, even in Perry County, people say, no thanks, don't bother me, except they might not say thanks. It might just be, don't bother me. Why does one village respond and one village reject? Why does one person receive Christ and another reject? I don't know. We only know that's the case. Let's just make sure we don't miss the opportunity to share the news anyway with those around us. We will at times receive rejection, just like Jesus did. Don't let it surprise you or distract you from the mission. Remember what they did? They just went to the next town. The fourth thing is the Lord Jesus had to rebuke his disciples back then. And he still faithfully does rebuke his disciples when needed today. Anybody ever been rebuked? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Just give a little smile like, yeah, I understand. I'll raise my hand. I've been rebuked <laughs> by the Lord, by his word, by his people. We're told that when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, you want us to call down fire to heaven? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And they went to another village. This was James and John. It was very immature, James and John. The fruit of the Spirit love was not very evident at them at this time. James and John were human as we are. This is Jesus' response. We are told that our Lord turned and rebuked them, and he said, You don't know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. You know, the reason is, we're doing a good job destroying our lives by ourselves. We don't need Jesus to destroy us. <laughs> he came to rescue us from being destroyed. You know, it's just like John 3, 17. You know, God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world. God sent his son that the world might be saved. Because it continues in John 3 that the world was already condemned. We're doing a great job condemning ourselves. God hasn't come to condemn or to destroy us, but to rescue us. We at times need such rebuking as well. Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. And one of the reasons that God breathed it and it's profitable and inspired is in order that we might be rebuked when we're doing something dangerously wrong. People are going to get hurt if you continue in behavior that is sinful. People you love, people who depend on you are going to be hurt unless something changes, unless you're rebuked faithfully by God, for His Word, by His Spirit, or by His people. Somehow, if God rebukes you for doing something wrong, receive it. Thank God He just doesn't shrug His shoulder and say, well, there He goes. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, it says in Scripture. If God rebukes you through His Word, through His Spirit, or at times through a faithful friend, receive it. If you find yourself needing a rebuke, receive it, repent of it, be set free from it, learn from it, and keep moving on. Don't go over in the corner and say, woe is me, poor is me. Say, thank you, God. <laughs> I got delivered. I was doing some bad things. But now I have life and hope and peace. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have such hope. We're not stuck in the mud. We may need a hand out of the mud occasionally, but we don't have to be stuck there. So those are the first four things we've learned. The Lord Jesus was getting ready and helping others to get ready. Are we doing the same? The Lord Jesus was resolute in setting out for Jerusalem to, to fulfill His God-given purpose. Are we fulfilling our God-given purpose in this life with such steadfastly set resolution? The Lord Jesus was rejected. We also will face rejection. And are you willing to move on to another opportunity when rejection comes your way? Without getting offended, without getting intimidated or sidetracked by the emotional hurt that comes along with that. And the Lord Jesus had to rebuke his disciples and still faithfully rebukes his disciples when they need it. Are you willing to receive a rebuke from the Lord, either from his word, from his spirit, or from one of his saints when you need it? And the final application point, point five. When you look at your face in the mirror, 
What kind of face do you see? Do you see a face that is steadfastly set to faithfully walk in the purposes that God has given you in this life? There's no condemnation in honestly considering this. Privately before the Lord, just consider it. Who is this person in the mirror? What is his face set on? What is he resolved to do and how to live? With God's help, we can all see a steadfast, resolute face that is given completely over to walk with God and happily serve others and happily share with others how they can be rescued. But to be that person who can steadfastly set our face to follow Jesus, to die to ourselves, to live for Him, we need Him. It's not in us. We can't pump up enough power to do that. We need the power of God to do that. And thankfully, He's a gracious, powerful God ready to give you that. He's just wanting to give that to you. We cannot do this in our own strength. It can't be faked. Let God do it in you. Invite the Lord to come into your life. Invite the Lord to help you. His face is toward you, not against you. We're going to sing a closing song here. And uh, use this song as your prayer. It's, it's a great prayer if you just go, go follow along with the words. This song, will, as, we, as we sing this song and pray this song, just tell the Lord that we desperately need Him to help us walk resolutely with Him to steadfastly set our face toward our God-given purpose for our lives. I'm going to pray first. Father, thank you that, yeah, we're not stuck in uh, random living. We have purpose. We have a Savior who was an example, who frees us, who rescues us. We can, with your power, Lord, live as we ought. We can be rebuked when needed. We can confess. We can repent. We can be cleansed and forgiven. And we can live how we ought to live. We don't have to be stuck where we're at, Lord. We can grow and mature. Help us to live that way today, Lord. And help us to earnestly cry out to you for your help to live this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Make us make this our prayer to our God.
That, you would, that would be our heart's cry today, God, that we would just, uh, with, that, with all we are, that we would need you. We would walk in you, Lord, and we'd resolutely follow you no matter what we go through, God. And so, God, we just thank you for your grace. Help us to live loud for you as we go out this week. Help us to be on purpose for the gospel in everything we say and everything we do. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.